We're activating brown fat. You mentioned the fact that what that does when it's activated, it starts burning the bad visceral fat. My question is, does it affect the subcutaneous white fat, which is also considered a bad fat, or is it just the visceral fat? All the all all, all types of fat, uh, but the but the key benefits, the most important health benefits you get is when it actually draws down on the visceral fat. So it'll actually shrink your waistline. You'll lose weight. Um, uh, you know, you'll um, your overall fat will actually start to shrink a bit. Um, you'll so you'll get the benefit uh, for your subcutaneous visible fat as well. But the invisible part is really what I want to draw attention to because that's the stuff that even skinny people have. A lot of people don't realize that you know this harmful white fat is um, uh, both visible uh, as well as invisible. The visible part is stuff that's you know lumpy bumpy. Invisible stuff's packed in your body, and it doesn't matter if you have a big body frame or if you're real thin. You can still have skinny fat. In fact, that's what they call it. Um, you know, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. It's that kind of dangerous fat. So. Think about fat. Like this is really the other thing that I think is so amazing about this new approach to thinking about metabolism and body fat. We used to assume, I mean, our, our, we think about fat really as sort of a, uh, a negative substance, right? Think about it. When you just, we all walked out of the, the shower in the morning naked and out of the corner of our eye, we see our, our, our reflection in the mirror and Almost all of us, myself included, have seen from time to time lumps and bumps that you don't want to be there, right? So immediately go, oh man, I'm getting fat. And it gives you, it sends a negative signal. So then the next thing you do, I got to get in shape. I got to eat better. Next thing you do is step on the scale. And if that number isn't what you're expecting to be, you're disappointed and you kind of curse yourself, right? So right from the get-go, as adults, we're assuming a very negative posture when it comes to body fat. But as a researcher, I'm a scientist. And as a researcher, one of the things that we like to do as scientists is to explore the origins of something and the origins of fat most people don't think about. And we think about it when we actually step out of the shower, but we don't think about where fat came from. And it turns out fat in our bodies started to form when we were still in our mom's womb. All right. So we began having fat uh, long before we had a face we could stuff with food. So then the question is like, well, what, why is fat important? Why is it forming so early? And this is what's really interesting. When your mom's egg met your bad, dad's sperm, turned into a ball of cells, and that ball of cells started to um, transform itself to become the future you, the first tissue that gets laid down is your circulation because every organ that forms is going to need a blood supply. The second tissue that forms are nerves because every organ is going to need really a wiring to actually instruct it what to do. The third tissue that forms is body fat, fat cells, little tiny globules of fat cells, which are actually fuel tanks for energy, form. And you know where they form? They form around blood vessels like bubble wrap, wrapped around every blood vessel. Now, why is that? It turns out that makes total sense because ultimately, when we have energy from our food that we eat, that energy goes into our bloodstream, right? And then our blood, when we want to store that energy for use later, are the, the energy comes from the bloodstream and it gets stored into these little fat cells. So fat at that level is really just a fuel tank. One of the many things fat does is a fuel tank. You store energy in it. So fast forward to nine months, you're born, right? Uh, fat figured adults might not be the most uh, pleasing thing that you would see in a mirror, but when you see a healthy baby, a fat, pudgy, chubby baby is the cutest, healthiest baby you've, thing you've ever seen. Fat, chubby cheeks, round belly, arms and legs that look like a balloon that the clown twists in the circus to make little toy poodles. All right. A, a fat baby is a healthy baby, right? So this is like a completely different kind of a jarring appreciation of like when we see, first see fat on the human, it's associated with health. In fact, if you saw a baby, a newborn who had chiseled cheekbones, thin arms, and long, thin thighs, like a runway model, you'd be freaked out. You would say, there's something seriously wrong with that baby. And you'd be right. And so this actually is to lead what to think about what does fat actually do? I told you it's a store, uh, a fuel tank. Very, very important because energy has to be stored every single day to a power us. Anybody who's watching this, listening to this is using fuel just to be alive and to, and to pay attention. Number two, Fat is a cushion. It's not just a, it's not a layer of blubber like in a whale. Uh, okay, it's actually a cushion. 
and, and the cushion in our body protects our organs. So if you didn't have body fat, you tripped on the rug and you fell on the ground, your organs would split open. All right. Thank goodness we have some protective cushiony fat. The third thing that um, uh, I talked about that uh, in my book that is a bit of a surprise is that fat is now recognized as a normal, healthy organ organ in the body. An organ just like your pancreas, your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart. Fat is an organ and not just any organ. It's an endocrine organ, which means that it's an organ that secretes hormones. Now, one of the things I write about in Eat to Beat Your Diet is that there's at least 13 hormones that have been identified um, that fat makes, normal, healthy hormones that our fat makes, just like your testicles and just like your thyroid and just like your ovaries make hormones. Our fat makes normal hormones. Three of them turn out to be super, super important when it comes to our health and maintaining good body uh, composition, meaning regulating our body fat while giving us energy. One of those hormones is called leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N. And many people have heard of leptin, okay? Sometimes known as a satiety hormone, it it regulates your appetite. When you have more leptin, you're less hungry. I would actually encourage you to think about leptin as a volume switch. It turns up and can turn down your, your appetite in your brain. And that's really important. So we know when, when we're actually going to want to eat something, right? So think about it. If our body is like a car, most people you know, have driven a car. Um, in a car, you've got an engine. You need fuel to run that engine. And in a car, you look at the fuel gauge. When a fuel gauge runs low, you want to pull over to the filling station and put that nozzle from the gas pump filling state at the filling station into the gas tank to fill it up. In our bodies, that's basically when we're lo- running low on fuel. Our fuel gauge goes, oh, got to got to load up. Leptin goes down. That's like our fuel tank, our fuel gauge. We pull over, not to the gas station, but to the dinner table, to the refrigerator, to the pantry. And then we fuel up with food. So just like gasoline at a filling station is fuel for your car's engine, food that we eat is fuel for our body that gets into our bloodstream and then gets loaded into our tiny little fat cells as a way of storing that energy. All right. And so that's one of these three hormones that are really, really important. Important for metabolism, normal, healthy metabolism. It's made by body fat as an organ. Second uh, hormone that's really important um, uh, is if I were to, uh, as a doctor, um, uh, take a vial of blood, you know, after a medical visit with with you, Jesse, and send it to an ordinary hospital laboratory. Okay, and I asked as a doctor for the lab to actually um, give me a profile of all the hormones that are in your blood. All right testosterone and thyroid hormone, all the usual players, cortisol. Um, uh, I will tell you there's one hormone called adiponectin. Adiponectin is made by adipose tissue, which is fat. Adiponectin is a second fat hormone. That level, your level, would be 1,000 times higher in your blood than any other hormone. Higher than testosterone, higher than thyroid hormone, all the stuff we get concerned about, right? You talk about it, it's you know, people are are interested in like, well, what about hypothyroidism and uh, and that? I can tell you, a diponectin is at one thousand times higher. Now, why is it so high? Why is this you know sort of like at an, at an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude higher than every other hormone? Because a diponectin created by fat for normal health helps your body's insulin, which is another hormone made by your pancreas to draw in that energy that comes from food, from your bloodstream into your cells. You need a diponectin for your insulin to work. And when your diponectin is messed up, which can happen when you've got too much body fat, okay, it's not working right. Now your insulin's not working well, so you're not even absorbing the energy and your blood sugars are gonna go up. So that's a normal hormone that, that your fat makes. Second one, third one is called resistant. Now the diponectin, the fuel storing hormone is the gas pedal. Resistant is the break. A diponectin is, I store that energy. The resistance, no, 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 not so hard, not so fast. It, it counters it, all right? These three hormones are all part of normal function. That's how we can get out of bed in the morning. That's how we can go take a walk. That's how we can actually, you know, uh, pet our dog. All those things are, are regulated for normal energy, normal function, normal living, normal aging. Uh, by our body fat. So the interesting thing um, uh, is that is is our fat is an organ, and the and the fourth thing that um, fat does again is to serve at that space heater. 
this torch. All right. And that's the big surprise because until recently, we kind of just referred to brown fat as this thing that animals have when they hibernate and maybe babies have a little bit. Recently, you've seen like the, the fitness and, and bodybuilding community talk more and more about brown fat. You see that stuff on the internet. <clears throat> I can give you the scientists and the physicians, the medical doctors, if you want it. It's real. It works. And the amazing thing is that there are foods that we can eat, like the chili peppers, like the beans, like broccoli and other brassica vegetables, like capers, uh, uh, like green tea, like coffee, that activate that space heater function. And when you turn on the space heater, it needs fuel to burn, to make energy, to make heat. And where does that fuel come from? Guess what? It steals that for fuel. The brown fat uses the fuel from the white fat. So good fat burns down bad fat. And that raises your metabolism. All right. A lot there. And I want to stick on this brown fat piece here for a bit. Mm. So we know we can activate brown fat. It's going to burn the bad fats. So we know now there's these specific foods and chili peppers are one of them that can do that. Is it all about activating our current brown fat or can we make more of that given it's a good thing? And if so, how do we go about doing that? Yeah. So that's the amazing thing. Our fat has this incredible regenerative capacity, meaning that there are actual stem cells in our normal healthy fat. In fact, we have a name for them. They're they're not called fat stem cells. They're called adipose stromal cells or ASCs. Now, as a scientist that's been working on medical research to develop new treatments for heart disease and other diseases where we want to regenerate organs in the body, we've been looking at these stem cells that are found in body fat for a long time. And I can tell you in my book, I write about how powerful these stem cells and body fat are. So what do stem cells and body fat do? Well, remember I told you body fat actually are fuel tanks. When you actually need to store fuel, it can actually fill up what you got from birth. And But if you've got more fuel, all right, if you overeat, your body needs to make another fuel tank. And so it can actually just use a stem cell to make another fat cell. Oh, you overate, you really overate. You had third helpings and fourth helpings. Ah, your, your fuel tank's not enough. Now you got to make more fuel tanks, more fat, more fat, more fat. This is how when you overeat, your body responds by making more fuel containers. It's be like, you know, like a, a car. You just keep on making more and more fuel tanks. Pretty soon you got jerry cans all around the side of your, your, your pickup truck, all packed with gas. And that's basically our body's ability to do that using stem cells. Now, here's the key thing. Um, our stem cells in fat are very, very powerful. It it reflects how important our ability to regenerate actually is. It's a health defense system. It allows us to make uh, make more organs that are injured, make more fuel tanks. But here's the thing. Uh, Before we talk about like the the foods that can cause stem cells and fat and harmful fat to create more brown fat, which is what you want to do. You want more hero fat. You want more of that fat burning fat. All right. But let me just tell you how powerful these stem cells are. I write about this in my book. Um, We've been doing research for for about a decade now, a little bit more, um, seeing if we can actually take people who have excess body fat and you use liposuction, which is what plastic surgeons do. It's like a little vacuum cleaner hose and you and you suck out body fat and you get a jar of body fat. It's like this yellow gunk. And what you do is you pour in a little enzyme. All right. uh, And the enzyme dissolves up the fat separates the cells. And then you put it into a centrifuge. It spins it around, round and around and around, faster and faster. And what happens is the stem cells go to the bottom and the fat floats to the top. And then as a researcher, we pour off the fat. Now, it's really interesting. And this is what's been going on for about a decade now. We take that tube of the stem cells in the bottom and you can hand it to a, wait for it, cardiologist. Plastic surgeon can hand their stem cells from fat to a cardiologist who will then load it up, inject it into your heart. And for people who have heart disease, and what we've seen, it'll grow new blood vessels, it'll grow new heart tissue. You can take people who are cardiac cripples and regenerate parts of their heart function. Amazing. And in my book, not ready for prime time yet, but it's part of the research that's going on. And in my book, I write about an even more amazing application. And that is that These stem cells are context dependent, meaning that they will turn into whatever whatever is around them and what they what they feel like turning into. So when they're in fat, they're more likely to turn into fat. When they're in the heart, they'll turn into heart tissue. So this was and it turns out they'll also turn into nerve tissue as well. Okay, so I read about a case about a thirty year old 
um, young man who actually fell off a ladder and he broke his neck and became a quadriplegic, could not move his arms and legs, wheelchair bound, horrible in a young person. And um, he volunteered into a clinical trial in order in which he, uh, plastic surgeons took his body fat, spun it down, got the stem cells, handed the stem cells to a neurologist who injected it in the stem cells into his severed spinal cord. And guess what? It grew back spinal cord. And before long, he could move his arms and legs again, which is, you know, like that, that's jaw dropping that the, these stem cells are so powerful. So back to fat stem cells in fat. Turns out there are certain foods that we can eat that can also redirect our stem, our fat stem cells, these adipose stromal cells to say, you know what? Don't make any more white fat. Don't make many more fuel tanks. All right. Why don't you go make some more brown fat instead? What are some of the foods that can actually do this? It turns out tomatoes with lycopene can redirect stem cells to start, turn into um, from white fat into brown fat. So you can make more of the, 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 the space heater function. That is really, really cool because we want more of that, right? We want more, inter- like our, we want more power. It's like more ammo to be able to burn down, like a, like a, an extra afterburner, uh, you know, on a racing car to be able to actually burn down um, uh, more of the harmful extra fuel stored in our white fat. Another food that can actually do this, um, uh, brassica. So broccoli is um, has got like is one of the brassicas has sulforaphane, but guess what? So does Swiss chard. So does bok choy. This whole family of foods have sulforaphanes that when you eat them, actually can help to redirect your stem cells to say, hey, buddy, nah, don't make any more white fat. We don't want that. We want you to make more brown fat because it's time to burn down some harmful fat. All right. So we can stimulate brown fat with certain foods. We can use other foods to stimulate stem cells that are going to make more brown fat that can be stimulated. How do we assess how much brown fat we have, or is that even of concern? Okay, so brown fat is invisible to us because it's close to the bone, <clears throat> it's paper thin, um, and you just just know that it's there. Like that is our birthright to have some brown fat. Um, we do know that cold temperatures, when we're out in the cold, um, uh, in the winter time, for example. Or people who live in cold climates but work outdoors, like lumberjacks working in uh, in, the, in Scandinavia, the cold temperature actually stimulates uh, brown fat and it generates warmth. You know, probably brown fat keeps our insides warm. That's what it does for animals that hibernate, um, like uh, these little um, uh, like woodchucks and those animals that actually have to fire up or bats. The brown fat keeps them warm for cold temperatures. But certain foods will also um, stimulate the, the 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 brown fat and it improves the metabolism and i'll tell you how we know in the medical research community that brown fat exists and how we measure it okay so i got to tell you a story and the story is that in the 17th century there was a research a biologist a naturalist who studies you know animals and things plants and animals named conrad gessner and he was collecting little um, uh, little uh, squirrel-like animals um, that lived in the Eastern European mountains. Um, and he was dissecting them and drawing pictures of their organs. And he found this thing between their shoulder blades. It was this brown lump. And he didn't know what it what it was uh, would do to, but he thought, you know, it was bigger in animals that were hibernating. So he called it a hibernoma. Like he didn't know what it was. He thought it was an organ. Okay, it is an organ. Um, fast forward, you know, um, into the 18th and 19th century, and even into the earliest 20th century, other researchers found that, yeah, you know what? Other animals that hibernate actually have this little brown lump between their back. Fast forward into the early, into like mid 20th century, the 1960s, um, uh, a UCLA researcher, by then we had the microscopes that were powerful enough to look deep down into this lump. He said, wait a minute, that is actually fat. But it's not white fat, wiggly jiggly fat. It's called it's brown. It's brown colored. Why is it brown? Well, it turns out that the nuclear energy that turns on this space heater, the furnace, actually is a, 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 an organelle in our body called the mitochondria. 
And when I was in medical school, I used to memorize things, right? So mitochondria, I called it mitochondria. It is mighty. It's small, but mighty. It generates a lot of heat. And because mitochondria, which is a natural sub-organ of our cells, actually are loaded with iron. And iron, like rust, is brown. So when you have a lot of this nuclear engine, the furnace, with a lot of iron in it, it makes the tissue brown. Brown fat has a lot of mitochondria, has a lot of mitochondria, this space heating function. Now it starts to make sense. So they looked in people. They're like, animals have it. What about people? People, um, like maybe babies have it. So they found that there's a lump between a baby between her shoulder blades that actually is brown fat. And then they thought, well, you know, humans aren't born in the wild anymore, not on a cave floor. They don't need they don't need that. We're born and we put them in incubators if they need heat. Um, and we grow up with, you know, with thermostats and, and things like that. So um, must be vestigial, like your appendix or like your tonsils. Well, we know for now, for sure, that the tonsils and your appendix are not vestigial by, by any means. They're important parts of our, they harbor our gut microbiome. They're important parts of our defense. All right. And by the same token, Brown fat is present not only in babies, but in adults. Now, how did we find it in adults? This is an interesting story. In the 90s, there was actually a researcher that, it was a patient that came to a Boston hospital who had a tumor in her chest. And um, when they, and right at the time, they had these scanning devices called PET scans, positron emission tomography. And when you do a PET scan, it's kind of like a CT scan or an MRI or an X-ray. It takes a picture of your body but it doesn't take a detailed picture. What it does is it measures metabolism. It shows you what parts of your body have higher metabolism. And when they took a PET scan of this one with a tumor in her chest, that tumor, that, that ominous area in her chest, lit up like a Christmas tree. And like, oh my God, that thing is super metabolically active. When they biopsied it, they were expecting to find a cancer. And what did they find? Brown fat. And they're like, wait, this isn't a cancer. It is brown fat, and that led one of the researchers in Boston to say, I wonder if PET scans are actually able to find brown fat in adults. So he went back into the uh, medical records and pulled out a 1,000 PET scans from patients that actually had PET scans for lots of different reasons in the past and looked at them all. And what he found is that some people had brown fat, some people didn't. And he was like, ah, you know what? It's all over the map. We can't make any sense of it. But then he had its inspired idea. Going back to the hibernating animals, he said, let me check the weather forecast on the day each of these scans were done. And what he found out was on every scan that had brown fat lighting up around the neck, behind the breastbone, under the arms, in the back, in a little bit belly, like I told you where it normally is, it was a cold day, especially in the winter. So people who are getting their uh, scans, PET scans, for whatever reason, you can measure your brown fat. It lights up in a PET scan that captures the metabolism. So remember, brown fat activates your metabolism. It fires up. You can see it on the PET scan. And that's how we discovered. And that's how we know brown fat is actually activated. Can you find it like a consumer? Like, is there a way of biohacking your way to measure a brown fat? Not yet. However, there are devices that are being developed. Um, like there's one that I've been playing around with. Um, that's like a breathalyzer for metabolism um, uh, that actually shows you that you're burning fat. Uh, so that's kind of a surrogate. And what I think is going to be really interesting is as our um, our, our grasp of uh, new human metabolism starts to become even more well-defined, we're certainly going to be able to find a way to measure brown fat. And where that gets really interesting is when you start stacking the two. You talked about you know the foods that we can take in that are going to stimulate brown fat, but then you mix that in with, with taking an ice bath or a cold shower. I wonder, is there any research, you know, of where people are stacking that together and, and, you know, getting an even greater benefit? That's what's going on right now. There's the kind of research. I mean, now that we know there's brown fat there, now that we know that cold temperatures can activate it and, and, and your metabolism and foods can activate it. That's the next step. I mean, look, I'm a researcher. So as much as I would like to say, everything is done and we can just gift wrap and put a bow in it and then people can buy it online. I can tell you the exciting part for me is that we finally know that there's a path forward for people that have been struggling with their weight and cycling up and down through crazy extreme diets that, you know what, maybe we don't need to be dependent and grasping at straws anymore. What new, what the science of the new science of your metabolism is telling is that there's a path forward 
our operating system for our metabolism is already hardwired into us. And if we actually just start tweaking it and respecting what our body is capable of doing, maybe we can actually achieve these goals. We can achieve these goals, you know, uh, higher metabolism, less body fat, elevated health um, uh, without having to resort to these extreme diets, which is why, by the way, I put in my um, uh, book title, Eat to Be Your Diet. It's not a diet book. That's a trick title. It's actually an anti-diet book to show how our hardwiring allows us to achieve health goals without having to go on a diet. All right. So we know now brown fat, there's no technology to detect the amount we have, but we know how we can stimulate it or make more of it. What about the visceral fat? When you talked about that earlier, you talked about the fact that somebody can look like they're maintaining a healthy weight, but still have a problem going on inside. And you mentioned something about strangling from the inside. So obviously we know this isn't a good thing. And for somebody who is going to adopt a lot of what we talk about today, what I'm curious about, is there a way to get a baseline to see how much visceral fat we're at in the beginning and then hopefully take on, like I said, some we're going to talk about today and, and, and burn that away and get to a healthier visceral fat level. Cause I'm assuming, and you can add this in too, is everybody must have some visceral fat, even if they're in a healthy range, correct? That's right. That's right. I mean, look, remember I told you that we started to actually build healthy levels of fat as an organ in our body from the time we were in the womb. We want some white fat. We want some brown fat. The fat actually has a lot of functions. It's a cushion. It's a fuel tank. It's a space heater. It's an endocrine organ that makes hormones. So we want to have a little bit of this. Fat is not to be feared. It's to be respected. However, what we need to, so you don't want to get rid of all your fat, okay? You don't want to burn it, churn it, poison it. What you want to do is to tame it, right? And that's what's really important. And I think that's the whole idea. We want the fat to be something that's in harmony, in balance throughout our body. So there's brown fat, there's white fat. Within white fat, there's the stuff you can see, the wiggly jiggly stuff under your arm and under your jaw, the, the muffin top, all right? The visceral fat is the, of the, of the two types of white fat. The, the subcutaneous and visceral. Visceral, the stuff inside your body cavity, inside your tube, your body tube, is the most dangerous thing. Now, why is that? Because visceral fat literally um, uh, is the first fat to grow when you actually start to have too many, too much body, too much fuel from too much food. Okay, it starts to grow, and because your body cavity is like a, a finite chamber. Uh, all right, that's when the think about visceral fat normally like packing peanuts you go to fedex you get a box you're going to ship some champagne glasses you're going to ask for some peanuts to make sure like it's padded so it's not going to break you pour those peanuts in there loosely you you tape it up and you ship it off it'll be fine but let's say you were you know aggressive and you're like put the peanuts in you got to keep on packing the peanuts i bought that whole bag of peanuts i'm going to use all the peanuts into this box now this box actually is like bulging with peanuts and in fact the peanuts are so packed in there that they're crushing the champagne glasses, for example, you're going to force the box shut, tape it, and an arm's length is still a skinny box. But guess what's in there? Those peanuts are actually choking your whatever you're shipping. Same deal when visceral fat grows too, too, too aggressively. It becomes that base focal to strangle your organs. Now, how do you know that you have growing visceral fat? There's a couple of ways. One, it's kind of obvious. Your waist circumference expands. Your belt, you suddenly need a bigger size pant. You know, the old clothes don't fit so well. All right. This is kind of like also the beer gut. All right. You wind up actually having bigger and bigger circumference. The tube of your body gets bigger because the fat inside the peanuts in there are stretching your skin. All right. So how can you tell when you're actually losing visceral fat? Very easy. You can actually close down an extra belt hole. You're getting smaller. Another pants fit better. That's like a surrogate simple easy peasy way to know if you're losing visceral fat. Now you can actually get more uh, sophisticated. You can do a DEXA scan, right? That's a scan that actually measures body composition with how much is muscle, how much is bone, how much is body fat. And a, a DEXA scan, which is pretty sophisticated, um, uh, and, but people can get a DEXA scan, uh, like fitness experts do that. You can actually measure exactly how much visceral fat you have. And you can do that over time to see if you're losing any of it. But for most people who don't want to go to that trouble, your belt size, your waistline, your clothing is actually a really, really good surrogate. Um, uh, so that's, this is where when I was talking about eating the beans and the research showing that, you know, you're, you, can, you can lose one belt hole, like that's an inch. That's pretty amazing that just eating beans can actually do that. 
I'm glad you clarified. Where I got confused, I was thinking of subcutaneous white fat as a separate silo from visceral fat. You explained there that white fat has basically, it splits off into the two, the subcutaneous mm -hmm. and the visceral. So now that makes a lot more sense. So thank you for yeah. You got, you got You got fat, you got brown, and you've got white. And of the white, you've got two kinds. You've got visceral, which is gut fat, and you've got subcutaneous, wiggly jiggly fat. All right. Now, one thing I wanted I, that I was meaning to get to that this is another really important thing. Do you know where is one of the first places you gain when you're gaining body fat, gaining weight? Do you know where the one of the first places in your body that you're gonna that the fat actually accumulates? Where do you think that might be? I would guess the belly. Right. That's what most people think because that's what you can see. You know, my belly's getting bigger. I must be gaining weight. Not true. It turns out one of the most sensitive places that you start to gain body fat as you're gaining weight. And this is true in skinny people as well, as well as big people, uh, large, larger size body people, is your tongue. Your tongue gets fat. You can get a fat tongue. Now, here's how it works. And this has been studied by people who look at anatomy of the tongue. So the tongue actually has three parts. The tip of the tongue is like Cirque du Soleil. It's like an acrobat. It can do all kinds of fancy things at the very tip. The middle of the tongue is, is muscular, okay? It is super strong and muscular because it moves food around in your mouth, okay? The back of the tongue is kind of like a big bean bag, and it is marbled with fat, visceral fat, like a ribeye steak. That's normal, healthy. That's the way the tongue is actually made. So when you actually start to gain visceral fat, one of the first places that the visceral fat starts to grow is in the back third of your tongue. Now, how do we know this? This has actually been studied in skinny people, in fact, skinny women. And, and, what, and what, we, what happens is that um, uh, uh, people notice that, uh, usually it's the bed partners that say this, that, hey, you know what? You started snoring. Did you know that? You weren't snoring before. Now you're snoring. And the, and the person goes, you know what? Actually, that's really weird because I'm starting to gain a little bit of weight too. And so this is the connection. When you're growing more body fat, your tongue gets fatter in the back of your tongue. And what happens is, think about it. When you're sleeping, you're relaxed. And when you're relaxed, your tongue is also relaxed. And your fat tongue starts to slide back and block your airways. Now, you snort. You don't sleep that well. It's called sleep apnea. And you actually snore as well. So snoring is another biomarker of accumulating extra, extra visceral fat in the back of your tongue uh, that actually is indicating that you're actually starting to gain weight and gain body fat. That's so interesting. And while we're talking about the different types of fat here, one more area I want to dive into. We know we can take certain foods in. They're going to impact stem cells and convert the white fat to the brown fat. You talk about a term in the book, browning of fat. Is that different or is that involve the stem cells? It's different. It turns out that there are some foods that can also take white, jiggly, subcutaneous, or visceral fat. And the natural chemicals in the foods can basically tap the white fat in the shoulder and go, hey, buddy, you know what, white fat? I, I, I'm going to try to convert you to being the good fat, the good brown fat. And so white, the, 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 the color between white and brown is beige. And so they call that beijing. So certain foods can even convince some of your white fat to turn brown like so that fat that was once wiggly and jiggly in a fuel tank can start to become fuel burning as well and this is how powerful foods can be they elevate your metabolism by burning down fuel by making more of the mighty chondria fat lo loaded fat that can burn down fuel by convincing stem cells to make more of that good kind of fat and by even convincing the wiggly jiggly uh, harmful fat to actually also become more of that good fat as well. This is really untapped human potential, literally, that is baked into our bodies as part of our operating system. And when you realize that foods that we eat can activate the different parts of these systems, you realize that, hmm, wait a minute, we don't need to fear our food. We should think about which foods can actually do this. And that all of a sudden flips, turn, really turns the entire, turns the tables on this idea of dieting by deprivation. Now, why don't we set the table and decide what dishes we're actually gonna put in front of us with using ingredients that can do that. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. You hear me talking about this in a very excited way because I'm a scientist and I love discovery and we are discovering more.
about the healthy parts of our body fat, how to tame our body fat using food, using metabolism, using fasting.